Dr. Nick Beeching uh, has kindly agreed in doing a talk on human brucellosis. Uh, Dr. Nick Beeching uh, is a, a specialist in infectious diseases and he is a consultant at Tropical and Infectious Disease Unit of the Royal Liverpool University Hospital. He's an honorary senior lecturer in infectious diseases at the LSTM, that's the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And uh, he holds many other posts as well. And uh, this talk is a pre-recorded uh, talk that we will be broadcast as uh, telecasting. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm sure you've had a, a wonderful session so far. And thank you for allowing me to join you from Liverpool. I'm really sorry I can't be there in person, um, but at least I have a chance to talk about one of my most favorite diseases. I'm gonna switch my picture off so as not to distract you. And uh, my subject today is brucellosis, uh, also known as Malta fever or rock fever or even Bangs disease named after a Danish uh, microbiologist. So, uh, I have uh, no conflict of interest to declare, except that I was born in Malta and I was born in the Bruce Military Hospital. So the objectives of the talk today are to give you a bit of an idea about the epidemiology and the natural history of brucellosis, to present a couple of cases to you to give you an idea of the key clinical presentations, uh, to cover very briefly the key issues in diagnosis and case management, and above all, to appreciate the importance of veterinary control for humans, because this is an animal disease that humans catch by mistake. Uh, it's been known uh, for a very long time that there are different fevers around the Mediterranean area, as well as the rest of the world. And here are the Knights of St. John of Malta looking after their fever patients. And here is the sort of patient they were dealing with. This was actually a medical colleague of mine when I saw a lot of brucella working in uh, Saudi Arabia. So he presented to me with a four-day history of rigors, anorexia, uh, significant lethargy, and myalgia. Now, he had had a similar illness about six months before. Uh, whether this is relevant or not, we don't know. But he certainly liked to consume a lot of raw goat's cheese. On examination, he had a moderately raised temperature and a low pulse, which might make th some of you think of typhoid with relative bradycardia and other things similar to a mild case of typhoid. His spleen was just palpable. He had a slightly reduced white count, that's the WCC. His platelets were slightly reduced and his transaminase, this is AST, was twice the upper limit of normal. Uh, Further investigations showed that serology was strongly positive for brucella. I will come back to that later in the talk. And we did extended blood cultures and they became positive at 16 days. And this is typical of brucella. It takes a very long time to culture in ordinary blood cultures stop. So this is an uncomplicated febrile presentation resembling mild typhoid, which many patients have. And if a patient like this presented to you in Sri Lanka, you might well think of typhoid. You might even think of dengue, although it's not absolutely typical. But this actually can go on for rather longer than those infections. It was recognized uh, a long time ago that the fever could persist for a long time. Each of these squares going across is a day. And you can see the fever in Fahrenheit here undulating over weeks. And another name for this is undulant fever. Uh, nearly 200 years ago, Marston described his own symptoms uh, similar to the above, but he also was the first to clearly link uh, brucellosis to its rheumatic sequelae and other complications. And this was one of the things that distinguished it from malaria or typhus or typhoid or many of the other infections that couldn't be diagnosed properly uh, before the modern era. And then in 1886, this cheerful looking fellow, David Bruce, was the first to actually isolate uh, the bug, which of course we now call after him instead of micrococcus. And he got this from the spleen of dying patients. And he and other members of his laboratory staff 
also caught brucella. This was a major problem for British troops in Malta, and here are the cheerful chappies of the Mediterranean Fever Commission over a hundred years ago sent to sort out this problem with Bruce sitting in the middle. It was a problem because uh, at any given time, 3% of the British forces were off sick. Uh, it had a small mortality, mostly due to endocarditis. And at that time in the infancy of microbiology, they were able to show that two thirds of their patients were blood clots were positive. It was also present, present in urine, and they also appreciated that it was a significant laboratory hazard. However, it took them a long time to work out where it had come from, and they sort of thought it was airborne, and eventually they realized that it was being taken to the doorstep and delivered in the milk of goats. And here we have a goat in Medina uh, being milked at the doorstep. Following this, uh, they also showed that it could be prevented by pasteurization of milk. And this is a natural experiment. Uh, in 1906, uh, all British forces, uh, the Navy in blue and the Army in red, uh, were told they could not consume any goat cheese or milk unless it had been pasteurized. And you can see and, and that the bars show the number of cases in each of those forces each year. So that by 1907, this had almost disappeared by this simple measure. The orange uh, curve at the top represents the Maltese civilians who are pretty unimpressed by the British anyway, and certainly did not want to pasteurize their goat's milk and carried on consuming it unpasteurized. And as you can see, there is no change at all in the rates of infection in the local Maltese population versus the British who introduced pasteurization. So, at the end of all of this Mediterranean Fever Commission, actually we knew what we now know today, that this is a chronic undulant fever similar to mild typhoid, but quite difficult to distinguish, unless it is linked to rheumatological problems, which occur in about 50% of cases. It has a relatively low mortality, but quite a lot of morbidity because people are depressed and miserable when they have it. It is the archetypal zoonosis, that is an infection of animals that's transmitted to man by mistake, and aerosol spread to laboratory staff was a major problem. The animals can look healthy but be chronically infected, uh, so uh, you can't tell by looking at an animal whether it's ill, but you can prevent its spread to humans by pasteurization, pasteurization of milk. Uh, not long afterwards, it was shown that cattle in particular, but also pigs and a number of other animals could host brucella and could pass it on to man. So what are these bugs? They're gram-negative cocobacilli. Uh, they're, they're rather simple in, in uh, evolutionary terms. Uh, they grow quite slowly and tolerate a wide temperature range. They're difficult to eradicate from the environment. And there are six main biovars or species. They do take a long time to grow, and these rather uh, small colonies were present, uh, shown here, where it took two weeks to grow them to this size, and they're easily discarded in laboratories that aren't used to looking at them. In animals, it's a sexually transmitted disease, and it can cause abortion storms. Uh, the bugs localize in the placenta of animals. Um, and it causes a major loss of productivity in animals. So it's very important to farmers. And uh, UK, for example, is brucella free. If it was reintroduced to us, it would be a disaster. So there are different species which tend to be associated with different animals. The one that was present mostly around the Mediterranean, brucella melitensis, uh, is especially associated with goats and camels and causes an aggressive disease. Brucella abortus is present in cattle and buffalo uh, and tends to cause more chronic disease. And there are other, the other main species affecting man is Brucella suis affecting pigs. It's transmitted uh, through inhalation of aerosols, which may be spread in abattoirs or in dust around farms, especially if uh, infected products of conception are left to dry and then dry up and get blown around. And the other main way of ingesting it is in dairy products, either in milk or in uh, products such as lassi or laban, uh, buttermilk, or in cheese, or of course in curd. It can cause 
uh, hypersensitivity to the skin in vets who have contact with it, but that's less common. And vets occasionally inject themselves by mistake with the live vaccines that are effective in animals, but not in humans. There are a number of other unusual ways it can be transmitted to humans uh, between humans, but these are exceptional and are usually case reports only. So I uh, was lucky enough to work in Saudi Arabia in the 1980s, and uh, here are groups uh, at risk of infection. Uh, Grandpa on the left is supposed to get the milk first, but of course these young scamps who were actually looking after the goats uh, were, were also drinking the milk and catching brucella. Uh, so goats are a major risk, but also they're doing hospitality. Traditionally gives you fresh camel milk, and it's difficult to refuse this politely when knowing that it has a high chance of containing brucella. Worldwide, uh, brucella is a major problem. Uh, the dark purple, especially Mongolia, is a high risk area, um, but it is present through much of Southern Europe and the Mediterranean, especially in the Middle East. Uh, and you'll note that the area around Sri Lanka is either white for unknown or yellow for possibly. Uh, and we now know that these data grossly underestimate the amount of brucellosis present uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, throughout the world, whether it's Africa or Asia, uh, the human factors associated with infection are poverty, uh, low education, poor access to healthcare. Uh, animal factors are importation of animals is a major way of moving them, moving Brucella around and poor husbandry. And of course, uh, control of both require political will for long-term control in humans and animals. Uh, it's now becoming uh, recognized uh, that travel is very important, both of animals and people. Um, and in the UK, for example, we only see about 10 cases a year, and these are all imported from other places. There are new hotspots. Uh, India and China have emerged particularly um, as areas where brucella is being recognized. Whether that is a true new phenomenon or just recognition, we don't know. And exports of goats, especially from uh, the Middle East to countries such as Thailand and Vietnam, uh, neighboring countries have led to introduction of melitensis in goats, whereas brucella abortus has been present in buffalo and cattle for a long time. So here are some buffalo, you're very familiar with these, uh, also a source of cheese, a mozzarella cheese in Italy, where they had major problems with brucella um, in about 10 years ago. And in India, uh, eating uh, unpasteurized curd, uh, a delicacy of course in Sri Lanka, um, is, is a risk factor. In Sri Lanka, uh, it was probably introduced in cattle after World War II, and a survey about 20 years ago uh, showed that up to 8% of bovids were positive, highest in Western province. And more recently, Lilani Karunanayaka uh, and others have surveyed humans and showed that uh, up to nearly 10% of high risk groups in animal husbandry. Uh, may be zero positive. But there's a big difference that in Sri Lanka, drinking unpasteurized milk is very uncommon. So this seems to be more direct contact with animals than drinking raw milk. So these are just goats up a tree in Morocco to remind me to change tack now to uh, the clinical syndromes that we see. And some people may have no infection at all. Acute disease is a short-lived history, rather like my colleague I told you about earlier, with symptoms for less than a month, whereas chronicity is symptoms that may persist for more than six months. And, and this is important because for acute disease, you may be able to treat for a lesser period than chronic disease. And in treatment, we are also taking into consideration whether there is identifiable focal disease. Uh, this is a series from Kuwait. There was a huge explosion of brucellosis in the 1980s, uh, late 1970s and 1980s in the Middle East. And this was one of the earliest series from Kuwait uh, where 90% of patients had fever. About 40% had various musculoskeletal MSK symptoms. About 20% headache, rather like typhoid. And again, about a quarter have a dry cough, rather like typhoid, although more severe lung involvement is rare. Genitourinary symptoms are principally in males who get orchitis, 
and the psychiatric manifestations are generally misery and depression uh, and frank psychotic presentations like we sometimes see in typhoid are much less likely. Um, the physical signs again up to 40% had objective uh, joint or spinal involvement, about a quarter have hepatosplenomegaly, liver or spleen, and about 10% presented with just lymphadenopathy, rather like a lymphoma, or these days we would have HIV in the differential diagnosis. So this is a very protein infection. Uh, and I'm not going to go through the details of this slide. Uh, it's a very nice review published about uh, 13 years ago, uh, summarizing large series from different parts of the world, uh, showing the, the prevalence of different symptoms and signs. Some of the more complicated presentations are endocarditis, which is unusual, but is the main cause of death in untreated disease. Uh, Low-grade meningoencephalitis, resembling um, sometimes a viral encephalitis, uh, always having to think about tuberculosis, and, and sometimes rather rare and bizarre presentations. Uh, and most of us as have seen a lot of brucella have seen occasional patients with quite severe epistaxis related to pronounced. Uh, thrombocytopenia, but that is not so common. The main importance of this is whenever you think of tuberculosis outside the lung, always think of brucella. And when managing a patient with brucellosis, we always have to exclude tuberculosis because similar antibiotics are used for both. In terms of laboratory tests, uh, as with the case I presented already, the transaminases may up a bit, maybe a reduced uh, platelet count, which of course we see in many other febrile conditions that are present in Sri Lanka and elsewhere. There are various kinds of serology, which are all terribly crude, uh, but can be performed in Sri Lanka. Um, blood cultures are best, but in using old fashioned um, meat broth cultures, you have to keep them for up to six weeks because they don't become positive for seven to 10 days and continue to be Come positive later on. More modern blood culture techniques you still have to keep for at least seven days, which is longer than many labs do. Of course, if you're taking fluid like cerebrospinal fluid or, or joint fluid, you can also culture that. Uh, and PCR is uh, at the moment not standardized and not widely available. So you can perform serology by serial dilution, as in the test tubes at the bottom. Uh, or they can be done on cards, and it just depends on your local laboratory. But what you must do is warn the laboratory uh, before you send the sample to make sure they do the test properly and also take precautions not to become infected. As I said, PCR is still experimental and not well standardized and tends to remain positive for a very long time. So returning to musculoskeletal syndromes, there may just be a sort of non-specific lethargy, sweats, anorexia, and pain all over. Um, another group is children often present with a monoarthritis, typically in the knee or the hip. Uh, and then the other common grouping is a spinal disease, especially in older men with chronic disease. Of course, there are many other possible combinations, but these are the common three patterns of disease. Radiologically, there is very little to see. If you think about what a septic joint usually looks like with loss of joint space, all we have here is where the arrows show tiny little erosions, but everything else is preserved. Although the same knee on a scintigram is really hot. That's the one on the left. Spinal brucellosis, again, very rarely destructive. It's not like tuberculosis. It's usually uncomplicated in three quarters. This is a big series from Turkey. Uh, and involves a single vertebra in 80% of cases. Uh, this is a wonderful slide from that same study uh, showing uh, from the left is cervical all the way down to sacral on the right, and it's mostly lumbosacral disease. Um, again, very little destruction of the joint space or the vertebrae. You can just see they look a little bit osteopenic with some erosions, despite being very hot on isotope scanning and really very minimal changes on CT scan uh, commonly. Uh, this slide is an, an exception to find vertebral destruction, which would usually make you think of POTS disease or spinal tuberculosis such as this. So uh, involvement of the spine 
uh, with any collapse in neurological problems is much more likely to be TB than brucella. Prosthetic joints can be infected. This was a, a, a traveler that we uh, saw in Liverpool a few years ago who presented to us with a 21 day history of fever and rigors and profuse sweats, which is very common in Brucella, some weight loss and swelling of his left knee. He'd had a total knee replacement following trauma about five years ago. And in his travel history, he'd been in Thailand for a month, returning three months previously. His only physical findings were a slightly raised temperature and effusion in his left knee, and x-ray of the knee didn't show any loosening of his prosthesis. So what do we do? Well, blood cultures were positive at three days, but we didn't realize it was brucella until several lab staff had been exposed. Uh, his serology was positive, suggestive of chronic infection, and we did a knee aspirate under careful conditions showing lymphocytes, which is what you commonly find, in uh, joint fluid or cerebrospinal fluid and was actually positive for brucella. So we treated him with a standard combination of prolonged rifampicin doxycycline and because he had joint disease, uh, any complicated chronic infection, these days it's best to add gentamicin for 14 days. Uh, we managed to get away without doing a joint revision and in fact in our case report uh, cited below, we did a full literature review and showed that about 50% will get away with prolonged antibiotics only. And of course, we had to give post-exposure prophylaxis to the lab staff uh, because of their high-risk exposure. There is a post to this. Uh, the patient regularly went to visit a friend who had a farm in Thailand, and on his last visit, he had helped deliver uh, baby goats, kids, and he'd handled products of conception with his bare hands. So this is how he caught it. He didn't drink unpasteurized milk, and he'd not had contacts with cows or buffaloes or pigs, which can also be uh, positive um, in Thailand and Vietnam. And when he rang his mate in uh, Thailand to tell him, he said, oh, two of the other workers on the farm are in hospital with fever. So uh, they relayed this information to the doctors in Thailand who promptly uh, confirmed the diagnosis of brucella, which they'd not thought about before uh, in those two farm workers and treated them accordingly. So this is a traveler acting as a sentinel chicken for an infection that we would not have considered before from Thailand until the last few years. So coming on to the details now, treatment, these are more goats up a tree in Morocco, just to remind me. Uh, general management, exclude TB. Surgery is rarely needed for bone disease, but we have to over-treat with antibiotics. And there are different antibiotics that are used. And of course, the aims of treatment to make the patient feel better, that's easy, a lot of antibiotics do that. But as we learned very on, in treating brucella with the earliest antibiotics, prevention of relapse is really difficult and monotherapy does not work. So to summarize the approach to treatment, um, we would uh, follow people up for up to a year because up to 10% may relapse. And actually it's their general health and weight that are most important. Serology is not a very good guide. And to simplify the approach to treatment, uncomplicated acute disease, like my medical colleague I told you about at the beginning, is six weeks treatment. And it's very difficult to persuade people to take treatment for six weeks if they don't feel very sick. So treatment adherence support is very important. People with more chronic or, and or complicated disease should have three months of treatment. And at least two drugs from different drug classes should be used. Uh, classically, it was streptomycin. We now know we can replace that with gentamicin, which is kinder and we're more familiar with it. Uh, Old-fashioned tetracyclines are now replaced by doxycycline. And in children, cotrimoxazole can be used instead of doxycycline. So the uh, WHO regimen uh, until the 1980s was tetracycline or doxycycline with streptomycin. And that is the regimen listed below in this comparison in real life. In the 1980s, uh, the WHO, with not much logic, introduced doxycycline and rifampicin, despite the fact that relapse is more common and failure is probably more common. So um, these days, uh, if you can be sure of good treatment adherence, doxycycline and rifampicin is probably acceptable. 
but if you're not sure, doxycycline and an aminoglycoside, probably gentamicin, is, is more likely to produce lasting cure. Uh, the last really good review was over 10 years ago, this systematic review in the BMJ, which again at the bottom favoured tetracycline streptomycin mixtures over tetracycline rifampicin for uh, preventing relapse. And these are summary slides confirming that dual therapy is better than monotherapy and six weeks is better than three or four. Uh, gentamicin can be replaced, can replace streptomycin, and disappointingly, quinolones are not as good as might be expected. Uh, they also suggested the management we use for our patient with prosthetic joint disease with, uh, with gentamicin added to the doxycycline and rifampicin. There are quite a number of unknowns uh, which still need investigation, but I'd move on rapidly just to special cases, the rare cases of endocarditis, we would give triple therapy and probably add keftriaxone for at least three months. And many of these patients come to valve replacement as well. Central nervous system, uh, gentamicin doesn't get into the central nervous system. And again, prolonged keftriaxone plus doxycycline and rifampicin may be needed for complicated patients. Uh, for laboratory exposures, we give doxycycline alone in the UK. There is no evidence that adding rifampicin is necessary, although that is advocated still by the American CDC. So finally, control of disease. Uh, this is a human and animal problem, and the WHO uh, key reference, which is now quite old, emphasizes this. Uh, for humans, we have to change their practices. In some countries in the Middle East, eating raw liver may be a risk for people, but certainly get it persuading people to pasteurize milk before they drink it or make cheese can be very, very difficult. Uh, people don't like getting rid of their sick animals, they can't afford it. And those that hunt pigs are at particular risk of catching uh, brucella and need to have uh, advice on how, how to do that safely. Um, for animal control, we need to restrict movement or screen incoming animals. And this is often difficult to do when large numbers of animals are being moved. Uh, the old practice is to test a herd and if any are positive to slaughter them all, but that means you then have to compensate the farmer, uh, which is very expensive. However, live vaccines do work in sheep and cattle and uh, prolonged vaccination campaigns can be very successful. And these have effects on humans. If you control the disease in human, in animals, by removing them, or, uh, like they did in Gibraltar and Malta, uh, or by vaccinating the animals, as shown in Kuwait here, you can reduce human disease just by controlling disease in animals. However, there are many uh, problems here. Um, vaccine schemes have to be continued for a long time and are expensive and owners have to be compensated. In some countries, feral wild animals can reintroduce infections such as wild pigs in Australia or elk in the USA. So mixing um, agricultural animals with wild animals can be a problem. So just to finish, this has been a whistle stop tour of one of my favorite infections. With fever, think of brucella, especially if you know the patient has come from an endemic area, which includes Sri Lanka. But you need to take that history of exposure and of drinking unpasteurized milk. It can be a simple PUO resembling typhoid or even uh, dengue, although it's a bit prolonged for dengue, but it may be focal. And if there are rheumatological features associated with fever, brucella goes up the diagnostic list. Whenever you're considering uh, brucellosis, uh, especially uh, the central nervous system or the joints or spinal TB, have you excluded tuberculosis because uh, there is an overlap of the antibiotics used and therefore a full microbiology workup is essential if you can. You need to use at least two drugs for a long period to prevent relapse and have prolonged follow-up. Uh, unashamedly uh, cite a few of our uh, book chapters and a monograph from uh, in the BMJ best practice, which we update each year. And I thank you for your attention and will be delighted now to take some questions. Thank you, Dr. Beeching, for that wonderful presentation, which was uh, pre-recorded and sent to us. Uh, uh, Dr. Beeching is with us uh, now.
uh, he is live streamed. Uh, if there are any questions, we can direct them to him. Uh, Dr. Beeching, if is there any uh, comments that you would like to share with us uh, in addition to your talk, if you had not been able to? Uh, yes. No, not really, except, uh, I'm sorry, I can't be there. Just a minute, Dr. Beeching. <laughs> sorry, it was a little bit okay. long. <laughs> Um, but I think it, it's, it's interesting that buffalo are a source of both leptospira and, and potentially of brucella. And as far as I know, there's only been one case report in, in Sri Lanka a long time ago of human brucella. And uh, I think uh, it'd be interesting if people start looking for it uh, in undifferentiated fever. So I'll be very interested to see if you start seeing it in humans. Okay. Um... What are the differentiative uh, features in regards to clinical features as well as uh, CSF analysis uh, between yeah. TB, uh, tuberculosis, and brucella? So, so the, um, most of the cases of CNS brucella I've seen have been a, a rather mild meningitis with mild neck stiffness. And the CSF is usually lymphocytic. Uh, you won't find such a high protein as you usually do in tuberculous meningitis, um, but it is rather variable. It, it may be mistaken for a viral meningitis. Um, so, uh, and of course, extended culture, if you have the facilities, will, will give you the difference as well. What about the radiological differences? Yeah, that, that's a very important question. So I think the key difference with if you have spinal TB, it's often very destructive. It starts uh, in the interdisc spaces and extends into the vertebrae and destroys them. And then you have old-fashioned POTS disease with, with uh, spinal collapse and involvement of the spinal cord. That is really unusual in Brucella. And I showed uh, some pictures of CT scans it, it's very unusual to have significant destruction of the spine or, or the disc spaces. So there are major, major differences. And if there is a lot of destruction, you, you would think this is TB, not Brucella. Uh, can you also say some life, uh, uh, sorry, light uh, regarding uh, relapses in brucellosis? Uh, what, what, what is yeah, your experience? Uh, so, so it's an intracellular infection, which is not very accessible to antibiotics. And you can get relapses. Those usually occur within one or two months of treatment if, if it doesn't work. It doesn't mean they're resistant. It's just a relapse. Um, but immunity is not solid and you can get reinfected. Uh, my laboratory uh, chief laboratory person when I was working in Saudi got infected twice. And although she was as careful as she could be in the facilities she had. Um, so uh, if somebody develops symptoms more than six months after they successful treatment is probably reinfection rather than relapse. Thank you so much for your time and for uh, being with us and joining us. Yeah. Um, <laughs>